Please open our eyes to see. Lord, we praise you of the promise of greater realities that are beyond us. Forgive us, Lord, that so often we're quite dull. Uh, forgive us, Lord, the fact that we can't see because we're looking in all the wrong directions. And so today, as we are gathered in the presence of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, and as we look into the testimony of his works, his signs, his power, and his authority, Lord, we want to have more than merely our curiosity stirred or information packed away in our head. We want to encounter light today. So please would you do that through the faltering words of a speaker, through your written perfect word on the page, and into our hearts that are receptive and ready. Lord, we want to see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so who am I speaking to today? Today I want to speak to anybody who struggles to see. And I'm not just talking physically. I'm at that age, I've bought my first set of spectacles. My girls think I look ridiculous. I'm still plucking up the courage. And it's coming, people. A moment is coming where I will have to preach wearing glasses. And it's really difficult because I've tried practicing it the other day and it don't work because the glasses I've got allow me to see here. But then the second that I look, try and look as far as, I don't know, that chair, everything goes fuzzy. So I, I need sort of like a little button where I can go shoop, 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 with the glasses. I don't know. Very focal. Oh, I'm not that old. Come on. Come on, people. So we're not just talking about physical sight. Maybe I'll be begging for those in just a minute. Thanks, mate. I can't see my notes, so this could go anywhere. I'm talking to people who just haven't got it all figured out. And I know how much that galls you, doesn't it? Because you love to think that you're the person who's got it all figured out, that you see what others don't. When a news article comes on, you can dissect it exactly. And when a news article goes on that just confounds you, and you're like, I haven't got a clue what's going on, you feel bad and you feel a little bit out of control. Because we are made to see. We're going to meet a story here of a man born blind, and it speaks of the tragedy of the world. Because what is the one thing that eyes are supposed to, be able to, supposed to be able to do? They're supposed to be able to see. And the darkness of having eyes but cannot see. We're going to be talking about spiritual blindness. And we're going to be talking about the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ came and he said, I am the light of the world. If you want to make sense of anything... If you want to know who you are, if you want to know why you're here, if you want to know where you're going, you aren't going to be able to find the answers by squinting like I do, trying to look at my notes. Those all come into glorious, radiant clarity in the light of the person of Jesus Christ. But not for everybody. And in this chapter, we're going to see how some are looking, but they're not seeing. And I wonder whether I'm speaking to anybody like that today. You're looking, maybe even you're like gracing me. Do you know what, Steve? I'll have a listen for a minute. But really, it, when that minute has gone, you're back thinking about other things. You're looking, but you're not seeing. And I think that is one of the challenges for us in the Christian life. When the struggles and the difficulties come flying at us, we feel like our sight has been taken away. Well, today he is going to show us what kind of sight he has got offering to us. And it's all going to be centered around who he is. And I sort of wanted to start with a bit of a strange question. I suppose it was this. It was, what is the difference between a rock and a plant? And if anybody's got any biological training, done their GCSEs, you'll tell me, well, one can grow, one can reproduce, the others can't. But here's the one thing that I can actually remember from my GCSE biology. Plants are responsive and can perceive reality in their environment around them. Not as much as you can, but they can perceive and see. So here are the two words that I actually remember from GCSE. Okay? Geotropic and phototropic. Have you heard those words? Don't I sound clever? See, geotropic is that a seed or a bulb can sense which way is up. Don't ask me how. And so why is it that plants grow up? It's because they're geotropic. They can sense something of their reality around them, and they grow up. 
Phototropic. Anybody got any house pot plants at home? You put one on the windowsill, which way does it grow? Towards the light. They have a perception. So here's the thing. Rock perceives nothing, is cold and hard. Plants is geotropic and phototropic and grows towards the light. But does a plant perceive everything in reality? Of course it doesn't. When you go to snip it and prune it, does it go, uh-oh, I've seen them before. Ah, run! Of course it doesn't. And then you move up to animals who can perceive threats and run away. But you won't find an animal perceiving the depths of reality and going, hmm, I wonder why I'm here. A pig will just see the trough of food, snort away and look up at the moon and go, and won't have a sense of grandeur and enormity. And what about people? There's a little baby on a knee over there and it can perceive when mum is near. Has it, has it thought and been aware of the greater things of politics and the academy and learning? Does it know the difference between the Spice Girls and Beethoven? Yeah. And that precious little life will grow and perceive and see and know more. It's one of the things that happens with us. We grow in wisdom. And perhaps we thought the world worked one way and then something usually painful happens to us and we say afterwards, and I realized that things were different. You know what realized is? Seeing, knowing, and perceiving reality. And here we meet a story where there are some incredibly intelligent people who know nothing about spiritual reality. Admittedly, there's some pretty low level people who know nothing about spiritual uh, reality. What is it that changes it? What is it that drives people more into darkness or more into light? It is the presence of the one who sees, knows, perceives everything. Doesn't just say, I am a light, but says, I am the light. Now, why have I labored this and talked to you about this? Because God is the owner of all reality, and you'll only see what he allows you to see. And yet we play a part in that because if you go to him and say, I can do this on my own, then thinking you see, you will see what? Nothing. Because all light and reality belongs to him. We're in chapter 5 of a block of 6 where there has been hostility between Jesus and the ruling authorities. And all the way through this, they've been trying to make up their mind, who is he who can do what he does and says what he says? And he is blowing all of their categories. And some of them are being drawn nearer and want to hear more. And others are more determined to kill him and get rid of him. Some are moving towards light. Some are moving into stubborn darkness because they don't want him to be who he says he is. And isn't that just a little echo of what we can so often be like? I want to play God in this world, in my right reality. And therefore, in order to do that, I will hold Jesus as far away as possible. And so the big question that we were left hanging over us from the end of chapter 8 is, why do you not understand? How will you ever believe? And it was Jesus who said that to the religious authorities. How are they ever going to perceive reality? And suddenly we enter into a tragic and illuminating and dramatic story of a miracle. Are you beginning to get the idea? What's it going to take for people like you and me to be able to see and know the God who made us and loved us, to value and worship and love Jesus, it is going to take a miracle. And so I'm going to say two things about this miracle, very simple. The first one is longer than the second one, so don't panic. Jesus alone brings sight, and Jesus can make you blind. Jesus alone brings sight, and Jesus can make you blind. Look down at verse 1. Here we go. Chapter 9, verse 1. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. Can you imagine what that would have been? If you speak to somebody who has moved into blindness out of light, they say, you guys get it all wrong. You think that all we can see is blackness. 
If you want to know what it is look like to be blind, try looking out the back of your head. You don't even see blackness. It's a horrible reality to be in. And this man born blind, he represents us. He represents the tragedy of a broken world. It is pictured in this one life. There are realities beyond him that are just closed off to him and he is powerless to do anything about it. And in this terrible situation, this misery has turned him into a beggar, verse 8. And so who is it that Jesus sees? He sees somebody with no perception, living a half-life. You can only imagine what it was like growing up. You can imagine the ridicule. He's a second-class citizen. So many opportunities are closed off to him. He has now moved to a point where he sits at the roadside and in order to survive, he has to take the scraps of others. And perhaps they throw them at his head and he's powerless to protect himself. This is his day-by-day existence. Scratching a humiliating and empty existence as he begs for survival. Now, I could spend an awful lot of time of, of saying how that is a vivid picture of life in a broken world where everything you try to do sooner or later backfires upon you. But I've got to leave that and move on. I want us to look at Jesus. As Jesus went along, where was he? The Lord Jesus was in the place where misery existed. As he went along, he saw a man blind. The man didn't see him. Jesus was already on the lookout. Please get this. God is not attracted by the potential of your CV, your past achievements. What is it that draws the attention of the living God? Brokenness, neediness, helplessness. That is the God of the Bible. He loves to come in where things are broken, that he can glorify his name by having encounters with him. So if you find yourself in a situation that could be described like that, you may want to get out as quickly as possible and you may try all kinds of strategies to try and get you out, but perhaps you need to be open to the possibility that the Lord has a purpose in it. The Lord is wanting to come near to the one who has very little attention, uh, potential. He is attracted to your need. And when the man wasn't even asking for attention, the eyes of Jesus were upon him. He has no interest in Jesus. He's just blind. But Jesus sees him. Now, I don't know how you would describe your spiritual state today, but Jesus sees it. Maybe you can see in part. Maybe you're looking back to past eras when you've seen more clearly. Maybe you're here today and you haven't got a clue what is going on, and as far as Jesus is concerned, he's not really featured on your radar at all before. Please, would you hear me? Jesus sees you and me now. And he wants to meet us right here. God's grace moves towards the helpless. He is not defeated by our helplessness. He enters in. He makes the first move to those who are trapped in darkness. Which means, right now, everybody should be like, Whoa! I didn't waste my time rocking up here today. Something could happen. If this present Lord Jesus Christ sees me and knows I need light, this day is trending upwards, people. So if you're struggling today, do not despair because Jesus sees you. Hallelujah. Am I preaching to anybody today? Jesus sees Steve Casey. Nobody else does. Well, you do, but... (laughs) Sorry for waking the baby. There's more to come. (laughs) He sees us, people, and he knows our backstory. (sighs) But, of course, the disciples, they'd miss this in Jesus' eyes and his intent because they want to play philosophy. They want to play the blame game. And so do you and I. Be honest. When something goes wrong, where there's a blame, there's a... Somebody's going to pay. Somebody's going to answer. And so this is what they say. Can you see it? Where it's only in verse 1 or 2. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? 
And don't we want to all live in that world of crime and punishment, of cause and effect, because that would make us feel so good, so that if everything is going swimmingly well in our lives, it's because I've really nailed it. And we want to be able to look upon somebody who's having a bit more of difficulty in life, and we want to be able to look upon them and go, well, it's because I'm better than them that I'm not where they are. We're drawn, our hearts are self-righteous, and they draw in that direction. And from a theological perspective, way back then, the Jewish authorities had sort of gone a little bit beyond the Bible and turned the world into a cause and effect thing, and the disciples go, I know, we'll get Jesus to, to, to deal with this conundrum, but he will not play their game. And Jesus answers them, and he says, neither this man nor his parents sins. And he's not saying that this man has never sinned, because he's got the same heart that you and I have got. He's not saying that his parents didn't make bad choices or sin. Oh, but by the way, it's really, to, it's, it's really difficult to have your sin cause being born blind because you weren't alive. But anyway, we'll move on from that. It doesn't make any sense. And he's not saying that sin isn't linked to suffering because, I mean, listen, we all know that there is all kinds of disaster we can visit down upon ourselves by our own self-importance, pursuing the wrong thing, denial of God, and thinking that we can play God in our life. And all of that stuff is in the mix, but Jesus doesn't take them there. He says you've got to be really careful when you see somebody suffering or you are suffering in your life to draw very straight lines directly between a particular sin and the sorrow and misery because the world is a more complicated place. So instead of playing their game, he goes in a different direction. What is it that he does? He won't play the blame game. And so I need to direct you and, and just make you think a, a little bit about this. Um, and I've got my piece of paper with my notes on it somewhere. Hold on. See, told you I need glasses. Need the glasses very badly. So if you are ever the person, kind of person who has sat down and thought about all the things that you could have been and all the things that you could have had, then you wonder whose fault it is that I am like this and I am like that and those things have been happening to me. Have you felt the draw into those kind of thoughts and feelings like that before? You verge on regret and say, well, if I hadn't done this then. And so you're trying to rationalize and make sense of your story. And we tend to do that. Whenever we cannot explain a dilemma, we will look for somebody to blame. And they're trying to play that game right here. But where does Jesus take them? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happens so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So Jesus sort of skips over the question of the cause and effect. He doesn't draw them sort of like a flow diagram. He says that there is something bigger than the flow diagram. He's saying that there is an intent. There is somebody who rules over, or should I say, can overrule our sin and our misery. There is, soon to be after this moment, a risen saviour who is ruling and reigning over the level of misery and sin. That should fill you with hope right there. And in that moment, he's beckoning them in to see this universe where there is a God who is working. And the, work, the direction of his work is to send his son to rescue people from their brokenness, to deal with their sin, call them into his kingdom, and give them an everlasting inheritance. And this moment, something of the story of this man is going to contribute to that end. And we would sit here and if we're really cynical, we're like, well, why did it have to happen to, like that? And I was like, I don't know. I'm in sales. I'm not in management. But the Lord seems to think that the particular details of this man's story was doing something wonderful. Can I tell you what that wonderful thing was? This man's life is a miracle waiting to happen. By God's intent, and the guy didn't even know it. And you know what that means? By implication, all the complexities of the details of your life, your ability, what you do and don't see in reality, what you have suffered, what you've endured, what you've gone through, what you've overcome, all of it is weaving a beautiful tapestry so that in any given moment, 
your life is a miracle of God's intervention waiting to happen. Because he's always doing this work. Did you hear what the words of Jesus? The work is meeting people in their blindness, whatever the details of the story, meeting them there that they may encounter the light that they need in that moment. Oh, please don't get the works of God wrong. We think that the works of God are the, is the thunderclap in the sky or the mighty movement of something. But what is the real work of God? One heart at a time, having more light and walking in the light and being able to see. This church is a gathering of little mini miracles. Are you ready for more? Is anybody ready for a miracle? Please, anybody from a Pentecostal background, help us. We're struggling here. We don't know how to engage with a preacher. Is anybody ready for a miracle? Yes. I'll give you a tenner later. Listen, the Lord is meeting with us here to say he's working. And of course, the disciples hadn't got that in their philosophy, had they? They hadn't got the idea of a sovereign God who rules and reigns over everything and he's working out his purposes and his purposes are a little bit bigger and more grand than ours. This blindness was to bring glory to God and to set people free. Now, I don't know why he needed to do it that way, but he did and he's smarter than me. Coming from my eldest daughter. Is right, girl. Is right. Now, God's grace moves towards this man and invites the disciples to think about a bigger universe, a sovereign working God who rules over the ups and downs. The world is under personal control, people. So are the details of your life. And I know you might be wanting to write to management saying, why does it have to work out like this? If that's what you preoccupy yourself with, you'll get stuck there. doesn't mean you can't ask the question, but don't stay there, people. And God is working to a greater end than this. They're like, who'd sinned? Mother, parent, what? what's caused all this? And Jesus is like, you don't get this. I've come to bring the exact opposite of what people deserve. The whole world deserves to be crushed in darkness for its rebellion against the living God and pretending that we, we can take his place. And Jesus comes in and says, I'm here. And my intention is to give anybody, whatever their story, what they don't deserve, can't get themselves and don't even know they, they need him until mud comes and gets slapped on their face. We'll get there in just a second. So as I say, this man's life is a miracle waiting to happen and so is yours. Are all the ingredients there for you today? Do you sense your own helplessness? Do you know you don't see as clearly as you need to? Do you feel like you're sometimes in the dark? And have you got a sense that you're only going to win if you get divine help? Then get ready for a miracle, if only you'll receive. And while we sift through the wreckage playing the blame games, Christ comes near to give light and make everything new. <laughs> Amen. Grace is in entering, Christ is entering, and he says, I'm going to enter into the pain, I'm going to enter into the world of sin, I'm going to carry it. I know what you need, and I'm more than willing. And we say, hold up a minute. Can I really trust a God who wrecks this man's life to become living proof of what only God can do in a life? Now, I'm really glad he picked that dude and not me. But 2,000 years later, what are we doing? The carryover of God's gracious intervention in lives goes on beyond we could, what we can possibly see or imagine. He had no idea that Katie would be hearing his story today. Do you think he would say it was worth it? He'd be like, yeah, bring on the blindness for 20 years, 25 years. To see that. Now, I know you want that for the person next to you and not you. All right? I'm clear. I get that. But how, well, how much would you welcome the Lord blowing up your plans for personal happiness so that you get to see his glory more and others get to see his glory more? Don't nod too quickly, people. Afflict me, Lord! 
pray that really cautiously. And I think back to all the times I've prayed, Lord, show me more of your grace and mercy. Show you more, you're, you're enough. Show me the fullness of who Jesus is. Help me to walk this narrow way. Help me to hate, hate my sin. Help me to love only what you love. And there are times when I look back and go, you idiot, you should never have prayed that. But in my better moments, I say, Lord, I wouldn't change a thing. I would not change a thing. So the question becomes, are you ready for a miracle? And the assumption behind it is, it's this, our plans are too small for the glory of God. Some of you are almost beginning to nod. That came home with such powerfulness to me. Can I tell you, if you, if you don't know me very well, I'm really quite... I'm not really that complicated. If you want to know how I work, you can track my emotions by whether or not my plans are working. I suspect I could do the same with you. So at the moment, very few of my plans are working. I plan to eat better. I plan to read my Bible more. I pray to, plan to pray for more people. I plan to have better conversations that are full, full of the Lord. I plan to prepare better for sermons and to preach better. Uh, I plan to be a better husband. I plan to be able to cycle up a hill pointlessly as fast as I can. Better. I plan all these great things. I, I look on the internet and there's all these people who've got that area of their life ticked off and that one. And then I get to the end of the day. And what has happened to my plans? Well, okay. Check my emotions. And that will reveal how well I think I've nailed my plans. And then as I was looking at this man's story and I was thinking about Jesus' plans for this guy, I realized that my plans are too small for the glory of God. And I know some of you, I know some of your plans. If you were to get a personal audience with the living God, what would he say about the size of your plans? Too small for the glory of God. What plans do you just need to say Not don't try and do it, but just don't live for it. Don't let your life be carried by your successes and failures. When there is a God who is bringing his presence near, and he doesn't need you to be able to tick off your list to achieve what he wants to do in you and through you. Oh, have a great ambition. But just remember who is God. And so I realized that this week, that my plans are too small for the glory of God. And hopefully right now, some of you are beginning to get worried because we're only on verse 4. Are you shaking your boots, Amanda? So what happens? The Lord Jesus does what has been so needing. He brings light. Look down at verse 6. After saying this, he spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva. Ooh, can you imagine how much spit's needed for that? You know, I could, pfft, e. made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This means scent. So the man went and washed and came home. And I, wanted, I could spend an hour here, but we're not going to. What do I want to say here? Christ comes near to this guy and he could have said, be seeing. But he gets up close and personal. Please get this. The Lord Jesus Christ touches the man in the place where he hurts the most. Are you prepared to let Christ touch you in the place that hurts the most? And he did it in a tactile way. It is personal care. But more than that, it's really unimpressive. Because can I remind you of this guy's story? How many times has he sat down by the, the side of the road like a beggar and somebody's kicked dust at him? Somebody's wandered by and just hurled insults at him. Somebody's probably stolen whatever was sitting in front of him and gone, ha, 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 you can't see where I've run off to. And now, without doing much, not even asking permission, the Lord Jesus comes along and gets a dollop of mud and physically shoves it into his... What was going through the guy's head? Oh, why are you adding to my problems? This is incredibly unimpressive. What good is this mud going to do for me? 
And I think in here what we have is a picture of how unimpressive our first encounter with Jesus may be. He wants us to know that he will work through the mundane and the boring. He brings a gospel that looks to the world like mud, doesn't he? You, you go from here and you think of your most loved family members who don't know Jesus, and you go, I want to just talk to you about Jesus, and what are they thinking? Oh, what's this mud? And here the mud is on the eyes, but there's the beginnings of hope because Jesus, I love this. Verse 7 is one of my, uh, verse seven is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It's so simple. So the man went... He did as he was told. He washed. <laughs> Look at that for understatement. And he came home seeing. You see, when Jesus is near, it is that easy. And I wonder whether he could sense it or whether he felt it when the hands were putting the mud on there. Here are the hands that formed people out of the dust of the earth. Here is the voice of God who said, let there be light, and there was. This is the Lord Jesus, the one who rules and reigns over all creation. Every atom is his, and he puts this right, and the guy can see. So what are we supposed to take from this? At the very least, it is this. If you're struggling to see Jesus today, you need a miracle and he is near, and he is ready. Will you put on the mud? Will you go and wash? And will you come home singing? I said we had two points today. The first was the longest. The second one is much shorter. But the first was Jesus alone can make people, or give sight. And the second is this. Jesus also makes people blind. And this is, if you like, this section, and what I'm going to talk about now, is, is actually the main point of the whole chapter. This is what Jesus does. He brings sight. But how do people encounter and either receive or reject this? So let's have a look down. We need to read verse 35 through to um, the end of the chapter again. And we'll do a bit of tracking back through just so you can see it. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, Jesus goes looking for him again. Because just giving him the physical sight wasn't the end of the deal. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ always wants to give you more than you're asking for. Always. Would you please give him that credit next time you're praying? You'll be praying for X, and it will feel like a massive thing in your eyes. But in fact, it's so much smaller than all the good things that he wants to do in your life. I'm not talking about him delivering to you your dream. Some, if he actually does deliver to you your dream, you, you'll realize pretty quick that it will probably end up being a curse. But he wants to do things according to his agenda that this guy can't even see. He doesn't just want him to have physical sight. He wants him to have spiritual sight. And he wants to be part of the journey as he gets there. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And then Jesus said, and this is the, the center of the chapter, For judgment I have come into the world so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. This is in many ways the story of the whole world in response to who God is, and it is your story, you're a part of it. And what is it? Christ came into the world, his purpose was to save, bring light. He says, I'm the light of the world and I want you all to get it. I want you to walk in the light. I want you to know my love and mercy. I want you to realize that you are most authentic and most human when you have known your sins forgiven by me and you are walking according to my word. His purpose was to come in and rescue people out of darkness. But look what happens. His purpose is to save but the outcome of him being present will result in two separate things. Some will be saved and some will bring judgment further on themselves. His presence provokes that in people. He's doing the same thing with all people. Ta-da! I'm here and I'm ruling and reigning, and you can get in on this. And some will have their eyes opened and see, 
and run and move towards him and others claiming they see better than him will walk away prideful and they won't know how bad their situation is until it is too late. So Jesus moves towards them. And let's see these two things working out. We can see it in the blind man. He moves from cluelessness to conversion. And we can't track back through all the words, but they, they start sifting through the wreckage of this whole thing. And people are going, what's going on? Are you that guy who we saw begging? Uh, you can't be. You can see. And he goes, I'm the dude. And then they take him off to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are like, what's going on, Ed? We, 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 are you sure you were blind? And they're like, well, listen, I'm absolutely certain I was blind. I see, saw Jesus, mud on face, went wash, came back seeing. And they're like, no, that can't be the case. Bring his mum and dad in. And they bring in his mum and dad and they say, listen, well, we know that this guy is our son and we know he was born blind, but who he was, uh, how he can now see, they can't even perceive how he gets sight, how he can see, we do not know. Ask him, he's of age. And so they ask him, and they say, well, it, he says, it was this guy, Jesus. All I know is I was blind, and I can see. And you can track through, because to start off with, the, the, the formerly blind guy starts off talking as Jesus as a man. Then he talks of him as a prophet. But then it goes a little bit further. Verse 33, which we've just read together. Oh, sorry, not, not read together. To this they replied, oh, no, not that, verse 33. If this man were fr not from God, he could do nothing. Can you see the beginning dawning of reality? So he's been given something of physical sight to see, but now he's on the journey of seeing who Jesus is. Now this should encourage us here. Because many of us, we like the idea of telling everybody else in church that we've got it all figured out, we know exactly who Jesus is, and all our doctrine is totally in line, but the reality is we don't. And there are some of you here who've got huge questions about who Jesus is, and spiritual reality, and whether even God is there and he loves you. But the question is, is which way are you facing? He's facing this way, and he's trying to move this way. And what I want to say to you is, don't let what you don't know about who Jesus is cut you off from what you do know about him. Don't turn around and walk out in a huff because you've got a few unanswered questions. Because the Lord Jesus, can you imagine the, the monsters we would come if he just downloaded everything into us, apart from the fact our brain would pop? All of that information, all of that understanding would be our excuse for avoiding him. So he gives us the light at the times and the ways that we need it. And this guy is moving in the direction of conversion. And it's absolutely beautiful here. Verse 35, Jesus has searched him out and he says, Do you believe in the Son of Man? That character from the Old Testament who was, who was perfectly human and would usher in God's rule and reign, a bit like a Messiah. And this guy's open to it and he's saying, I'm, I'm on the verge of this, I want to find out more. Jesus says to him, sorry, tell me who, uh, the guy says, tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus says, you have now seen him. It's like, uh, dude, I'm here. In fact, he is the one who's speaking with you. And that guy has this choice point there in that moment. He can retreat away, and it would have been a temptation because he's already been cancelled for not rubbishing Jesus. But he decides against, with the prospect of whatever it will cost him, he's seeing something with clarity, and he pushes into it. Lord, I believe. And can you tell how he's landed? What's the next word? And he you see, false worship is a blindness problem. False worship is picking something that you'll set your gaze upon and you will live out of it and you will live for it. Perhaps it's self-importance. Perhaps it's the relationship. Perhaps it's getting the respect you deserve. Perhaps it's getting security. Perhaps it's a political goal. Perhaps it's related to your family. And that thing will be so big that you will bow before it every day and all of your choices will come out of it. But in this moment when he sees, he sees the true object of worship and he looks upon Jesus and he prostrates himself and he says, I give my life to you. You are my hope. I want in some way to reflect you because we always reflect what we worship. 
You are my saviour. You are the Lord. I believe in you. And if you want to know what the key to the Christian life is, is starting to believe and going back to that same place every single day. Lord, I'm going to bow before you alone. You are the one who brings me light and you are the one who brings me life. And you couldn't contrast that more strongly than with the... If he's gone from confusion to conversion, they've gone from questioning to utter obstinacy. And we haven't got time to track it here. Maybe you can do this when you get home and you open the Bible and go back over this text, which you should always do with the sermons just to make sure that what you're hearing from me is what's in the Bible. You'll find that they get harder and harder. Partly through the chapter, some of them, there's a disagreement between the religious authorities and some of them are saying, well, this clearly doesn't make sense. If it, only a man from God can do what the, this guy's doing and he's doing it and so they're divided and some of them are going, bah. they don't want to hear And so where exactly are we landing on this? We're landing that when you are in the presence of Jesus, you really want to be on the side of sight. Because when he is present, those two things will always be happening. Sight and blindness. So perhaps you've turned up here and it was your last hurrah and you're thinking, I've been keeping Jesus at a bit of a distance, I'll go just one more time. If that is you here today and you feel him stirring something within you, whatever you do, don't let it pass you by. Because he is the light of the world and he will give it and he is glad to give it. But it is of such value that you don't treat it as a small thing. It means that if you're confused and can't figure everything out, you're in exactly the right place. And the question then becomes... Well, okay, let me put it this way. Maybe you're here and you're just looking in, and prior to today, you have felt nothing towards him whatsoever. He doesn't just even flicker the speedometer on what revs your engine. And yet today, he's troubling your thoughts, isn't he? He's troubling you. And you're pushing it away. Can I dare to say even that can be a good place if you decide to land in the right place? If he is even troubling your thoughts, can I tell you what that's a sign of? It's a sign that he is walking by and wanting you to see. If he wasn't walking by and wanting you to see, you wouldn't even have troubled thoughts about him. So turn towards the light. Say, Lord, I do believe but I need more light and would you show me more of who you are and the bits that you have shown me would you help me to take those to the bank worrying about the things that I haven't because I can tell that you are the Lord of history and you are raised up and you are reigning over all the sin and misery and my life needs to be in your hands I need the light of the world I'm blind who is it that he loves to come to? people who posture themselves like that and come and come towards him like that he is already seeking you are you ready for a miracle we're going to stand and sing